Center for Community Arts presents Pygmalion by George Bernard Shaw. Act 4. The Wimpole Street Laboratory. Midnight. Nobody in the room. The clock on the mantelpiece strikes 12. The fire is not a light. It is a summer's night. Presently, Higgins and Pickering are heard on the stairs. Uh, I say, Pick, lock up, will you? I shan't be going out again. Right. Can Mrs. Pierce go to bed? We don't want anything more, do we? Lord, no. Eliza opens the door and is seen on the lighted landing in opera cloak, brilliant evening dress, and pearls, with fan, flowers, and all accessories. She comes to the hearth and switches on the electric lights there. She is tired. Her pallor contrasts strongly with her dark eyes and hair, and her expression is almost tragic. She takes off her cloak, puts her fan and flowers on the piano, and sits down on the bench, brooding and silent. Higgins, in evening dress with overcoat and hat, comes in carrying a smoking jacket, which he has picked up downstairs. He takes off the hat and overcoat, throws them carelessly on the newspaper stand, disposes of his coat in the same way, puts on the smoking jacket, and throws himself wearily into the easy chair at the hearth. Pickering, similarly attired, comes in. He also takes off his hat. Oh, and chuck them all the banisters in the hall. She'll find them there in the heads. morning and put them all right. I say, to Mrs. Mrs. The drunk. we'll row if we leave these things lying about in the drawing room. I didn't look. Ah. Pickering takes the overcoats and hats and goes downstairs. Higgins begins half, we are singing, half yawning in air from Are there any letters? Suddenly he stops and exclaims, I wonder where the devil my slippers are. Eliza looks at him darkly, then leaves the room. <sighs> Higgins yawns again and resumes his song. Hickering returns with the contents of the litter box in his hand. Only circulars. And this Moneylender. coroneted billy do for you. Eliza returns with a pair of large down at heel slippers. She places them on the carpet before Higgins and sits as before without a word. Oh Lord, what an evening. What a crew, what a silly tomfoolery. He raises his shoe to unlace it and catches sight of the slippers. He stops on lacing and looks at them as if they had appeared there of their own accord. Oh, they're here, are they? <laughs> oh, well. I feel a bit tired. It's been a long Thank day. God, it's the garden over. party, a dinner party, Eliza and the opera. Violently. Rather too much of a good they thing. No notice of her. But and she recovers you've won your bet, Higgins. Eliza did the trick and something to spare, eh? Oh, she wasn't nervous. I knew she'd be all right. No, it's the strain of putting the job through all these months that has told on me. You can see the were you nervous at the garden at party? I was. That, Eliza I didn't seem a bit nervous. I hadn't backed myself to do it. I should have chucked the whole thing a few, uh, uh, two months ago. It was a silly notion. The whole thing has been a bore. <sighs> Yes, for the first three minutes, but when I saw we were going to win hands down, I felt like a bear in a cage oh, come. hanging around doing The garden party was frightfully was exciting. Worse. My Some heart began beating like any day. Over an hour with nobody but a damned fool of a fashionable woman to talk to. I tell you, Pickering, never again for me. No more artificial duchesses. The whole thing has been simple purgatory.
You've never been broken in properly to the social routine. I rather enjoy dipping into it occasionally myself. It makes me feel young again. Anyhow, it was a great success, an immense success. I was quite frightened once or twice because Eliza was doing it so well. You see, lots of the real people yes, can't do it at me all. Mad. The silly They're such fools that the they think style listens. comes by nature However, to people in their position. And, done with and, and so they never learn. There's always something tomorrow. professional about Eliza's doing a thing superlatively well. Murderous. Good night. Put the lights out, Eliza, and uh, tell <sighs> Mrs. Pierce not to make I the think I shall me turn in the morning. Into... I'll take tea. Still, it's been a great occasion, a triumph for you. Good night. Eliza tries to control herself and feel indifferent as she rises and walks across the hearth to switch off the lights. By the time she gets there, she is on the point of screaming. She sits down in Higgins's chair and holds on hard to the arms. Finally, she gives way and flings herself furiously on the floor, raging. What the devil have I done with my slippers? There are your slippers and there, take your slippers and may you have never have a day's luck with them. What on earth? What's the matter? Get up. Nothing wrong with you. I've won your bet for you, haven't I? That's enough for you. I don't matter, I suppose. You won my bet, you presumptuous insect. I won it. What did you throw those slippers at me for? Because I wanted to smash your face. I'd like to kill you, you selfish brute. Why didn't you leave me where you picked me out of? In the gutter? You thank God it's all over, and now that you can throw me back there again, do you? The creature is nervous after all. Ah! Ah, what you! Claws in, you cat! How dare you show your temper to me! Sit down and be quiet! What's to become of me? What's to become of me? How the devil do I know what's to become of you? What does it matter what becomes of you? You don't care, I know. You don't care. You wouldn't care if I was dead. I'm nothing to you. Not so much as them slippers. Those slippers? Those slippers. I didn't think it made any difference now. Why have you begun going on like this? May I ask whether you complain of your treatment here? No. Has anybody behaved badly to you? Colonel Piccadilly? Mrs. Pierce? Any of the servants? No. I presume you don't pretend that I have treated you badly? No. I'm glad to hear it. Perhaps you're tired after the strain of the day. Uh, will you have a glass of champagne? No. Thank you. This has been coming on you for some days. I suppose it was natural for you to be anxious about the garden party, but it's all over now. There's nothing more to worry about. No, nothing more for you to worry about. God, I wish I was dead. Why, in heaven's name, why? Uh, listen to me, Eliza, all this irritation, it's purely subjective. I don't understand. I'm too ignorant. It's only imagination, low spirits, and nothing else. Nobody's hurting you. Nothing, nothing is wrong. You go to bed like a good girl and sleep it off. Have a little cry and say your prayers. That will make you comfortable. I heard your prayers. Thank God it's all over. Well, don't you thank God it's all over? Now you are free and can do what you like. What am I fit for? What have you left me fit for? Where am I to go? What am I to do? What's to become of me? Oh, that's what's worrying you, is it? Uh, 
shouldn't bother about it if I were you. I should imagine you won't have much difficulty in settling yourself somewhere or other. Though I hadn't quite realized that you were going away. You might marry, you know. You see the lighter. Not all men are confirmed old bachelors like me and the Colonel. Most of the marrying sort. Or devils. And, and you're not bad looking. Quite a pleasure to look at you sometimes. Well, not now, of course, because you've been crying and you're looking as a devil, but uh, when you are all right and quite yourself, you're what I should call a attractive. That is to people in the marrying line, you understand. You go to bed and have a nice good rest and then get up and look at yourself in the glass and you won't feel so cheap. Eliza looks at him, speechless, and does not stir. The look is quite lost on him. He eats his apple with a dreamy expression of happiness, as it is quite a good one. I guess say my mother could find some chap or other who would do very well. We were above that at the corner of Tottenham Court Road. What do you mean? I sold flowers. I didn't sell myself. Now you've made a lady of me and I'm not fit to sell anything else. I wish you'd left me where you found me. Tosh, Eliza, don't you insult human relations by dragging all that cant about buying and selling into it. You didn't marry the fellow if you don't like him. What else am I to do? Well, lots of things. What about your old idea of a florist shop? Pickering could set you up in one. He's got lots of money. <laughs> You'll have to pay for all of those togs you've been wearing today, and that, with the hire of the jewellery, will make a big hole in 200 pounds. Why, six months ago, you would have thought it the millennium to have a flower shop of your own. Come. You'll be all right. I must clear it off to bed. I'm devilishly sleepy. By the way, I came down for something. I forgot what it was. Your slippers. Oh, yes, you shied them at me. Before you go, sir. Eh? Do my clothes belong to me or to Colonel Pickering? What the devil use would they be to Pickering? He might want them for the next girl you pick to experiment on? Is that the way you feel about to us? I don't want to hear anything more about that. All I want to know is whether anything belongs to me. My own clothes were burnt. But what does it matter? Why need you start bothering about that in the middle of the night? I want to know what I may take away with me. I don't want to be accused of stealing. Stealing? You shouldn't have said that, Eliza, that what says a want of feeling. I'm sorry, I'm only a common ignorant girl. And in my station, I have to be careful. There can't be any feelings between the like of you and the like of me. Please, will you tell me what belongs to me and what doesn't? You may take the whole damned house full if you like. Except the jewels, they're hired. Will that satisfy you? Will you take these to your room and keep them safe? I don't want to run the risk of, um, their being missing. I... Hand them over. If these belong to me instead of the jeweler, I'd ram them down your ungrateful throat. This ring isn't the jeweler's. It's the one you bought me in Brighton. I don't want it now. Higgins dashes the ring violently into the fireplace and turns on her so threateningly that she crouches over the piano with her hands over her face and exclaims, Don't you hit me! Hit you, you infamous creature! How dare you accuse me of such a thing! You have hit me. You've wounded me to the heart. I'm glad. I've got a little of my own back, anyhow. You have caused me to lose my temper, a thing that has hardly ever happened to me before. I prefer to say nothing more tonight. I am going to bed. You better leave a note for Miss Pierce about the coffee. 
You won't be told by me. Damn Mrs. Pierce and damn the coffee and damn you and damn my own folly in having lavished my hard-earned knowledge and the treasure of my regard and intimacy on a heartless gutter snipe. He goes out with oppressive decorum and spoils it by slamming the door savagely. <laughs> Eliza smiles for the first time, expresses her feelings by a wild pantomime in which an imitation of Higgins's exit is confused with her own triumph, and finally goes down on her knees on the hearthrug to look for the ring.